Hello everybody, welcome to Snyder's Inc. And today we got another thing of five mysterious unsolved cases. Part nine, we're gonna get right into it. Ladies and gentlemen, the like button, subscribe, and comment things down below. Let's go. The suburb of Setagaya in Tokyo is largely considered to be a safe and desirable place to live. Its numerous green spaces and spacious residential dwellings sharply contrast with the noisy, bustling city that surrounds it. However, that peace was shattered when the bodies of the Miyazawa family were discovered inside their home on the morning of December 31, 2000. They were, by all accounts, a nice and normal Japanese family. The father, Makio, worked for the marketing firm Interbrand, while his wife, Yasuko, was a tutor. They had two children, eight-year-old Naina and six-year-old Ray, and the pair had lived in the home for about a decade. In the months leading up to the murders, the Miyazawa's neighborhood had been slowly emptying out. Their property backed up to a public green space and skate park that the city was planning to expand, and the community had dwindled from over 200 families to just four. The skate park had become somewhat of an attraction to the local teen population, leading to loud and disruptive gatherings in the area from time to time. The week before the murders, Mikio had even been seen arguing with a rather obnoxious group of teens in the area. With the park's expansion, their shrinking neighborhood, and the increased teen presence, the Miyazawas had plans to move within the next few months. The house itself was a duplex that the family shared with members of Yasuko's family, but there were no internal connections between the two homes, and both dwellings had been soundproofed to provide additional privacy. On the morning of December 31st, 2000, Yasuko's mother, Haruko, who lived next door, phoned her daughter. She found it strange that no one answered, and so she made her way over to the home and let herself in. Already feeling mildly uneasy, it didn't take long to realize something horrific had taken place. First, Haruko discovered her son-in-law, Mikio, covered in blood at the bottom of the stairs on the first floor. Feeling her panic rise, she began to call out for her daughter and grandchildren as she ascended to the second floor, only to find Yasuko and Naina both stabbed to death at the top of the stairs. Her grandson, Ray, had been strangled while he slept in his bed. The murderer is thought to have entered the home via an unlocked window in the second floor bathroom at some point after 11 o'clock at night. There is loose evidence of the family being alive up to 10.30. Mikio accessed a password-protected email on his work account at that time, and it is unlikely that anyone else is responsible for that digital clue. However, as horrifying as the murder is, what makes this case truly baffling is the amount of time the killer spent in the home after his crime spree. Police believe that the man spent multiple hours in the house, drinking tea and eating ice cream. He left behind a fair amount of bodily evidence as well. His fingerprints were discovered on the ice cream wrappers, his blood was in multiple places throughout the house, and he had defecated in the family's bathroom without bothering to flush. He ransacked the home, rummaging through per- This guy did all of this, and you've not found him? This guy knew he was not in the system. That's the only reason he got away, is his- Um- DNA is not in the system somehow, so he's just been free to go. Personal documents, emptying drawers and dumping them into the second floor bathtub. While Mikio's wallet, items from Yusuko's handbags, house keys, and other papers were found shoved inside the toilet. Around one o'clock in the morning, the perpetrator accessed the internet from the family computer, visiting sites previously bookmarked by Yusuko and Mikio. At some point during his stay, the killer took a nap on the sofa. Before he left, he changed his clothes, leaving them neatly folded on the couch alongside his jacket, scarf, shoes, hip bag, and the knives he used to execute the murders. Not much was taken from the Miyazawa residence. Even though the killer had gathered the family's IDs and credit cards in the living room, he had left them behind. 
In the end, only about 150,000 yen, worth a little over 1,000 US dollars, was unaccounted for. Robbery was an unlikely motive, since there was plenty more cash readily available in the home that the intruder did not take. In the years that have ensued, this case has continued to puzzle authorities, and no definitive leads have emerged, although there has been a slew of theories. However, some concrete facts have been established via DNA evidence. Standing at roughly 5 foot 6 inches tall, the killer was of mixed race, with an Asian father and a mother with Southern European heritage. Unfortunately, the man's DNA and fingerprints have never been matched in the Japanese system, leading authorities to believe he is not a Japanese citizen. Several. That's what I thought. I thought that. That's what I said. He knew he wasn't in the system. He probably is not from there. Probably where his mom's from. He said Europeans, made from the UK or something like that. For some reason, when he visited, his dad decided he was going to murder this family. Several other facts have surfaced that point to the killer being a foreigner. A genetic sequence was found in his DNA that is more common to Korean people than Japanese. His shoes were a Korean size that only would have been sold in South Korea. And sand found inside his hip bag was traced back to Edwards Air Force Base in Southern California. Some have hypothesized that the killer was a military man, either American or South Korean in nationality, while others suspect that he was a hired assassin sent by a Japanese gang though Mikio and his family had no known enemies. It's also plausible that the bunch of youngsters Mikio was seen arguing with the week before had something to do with the crime. Possibly one of the young men decided to take revenge on him for daring to confront them. Perhaps the Miyazawas were- I don't want to say, I don't want to rule out a theory. I think that's a little much though. I mean, if a teen is that ego-driven, that someone just telling him, hey, you should keep it down and all that, caused him to murder innocent children and everything, I'd say, uh, I I'm gonna, don't pull a theory that that's not what it is. We're just profoundly unlucky, and the killer was just a drifter who happened upon the home that night. Nothing is quite clear in this bizarre case, and even though no major strides have been made in many years, the memory of the Miyazawa family is alive and well in Japan to this day. The police have adamantly said they will never give up until the case is solved. An investigator on the case, Yasunori Hirose, was quoted saying, With advances in science and technology, I believe that police will locate the criminal and eventually arrest him. In 2020, Mikio's mother, now 89 years old, says that she desperately wants the case to be solved in her lifetime. Despite the thousands of hours of investigation, this violent killer has never been identified, and the murders of the Miyazawa family is as much a mystery now as it was over 20 years ago. On the morning of September 15, 2019, in Glendale, Arizona, Jessica Nunez woke up to a strange set of circumstances. Her 14-year-old daughter, Alicia Navarro, had vanished from the home with a small backpack containing her phone and laptop, leaving behind a cryptic note that read, I ran away. I will be back. I swear. I'm sorry. Alicia hadn't had the most typical or easy of childhoods. Developmental delays had led to an autism diagnosis at age 12, and she had a difficult time connecting socially with her peers. Despite this, she was a star student and had found a fun and supportive community of friends through online gaming. Jessica, though happy her daughter was making friends, remained aware of the dangers of the internet. Once, Jessica had discovered that a stranger was asking for Alicia's personal information online, and the mother-daughter duo had a frank and serious conversation about safe behavior while using the internet. Jessica even filed a report with the police about the incident and believed the matter was settled and that Alicia was now well informed. The night before Alicia vanished, Jessica was up late, waiting for her husband to come home from work. Around 1 a.m., Alicia came downstairs from her room for a glass of water, and then asked her mother why she was still awake. Nothing seemed unusual to Jessica, and she eventually drifted off to sleep. In the morning, she noticed the back door was slightly open and asked her husband if he had left it like that. When he informed her that he hadn't been through the back door that day, 
Jessica felt uneasy and went to check on Alicia. It was at this time that she discovered an empty bedroom, Alicia's missing electronics, and the strange note. Racing out the back door, Jessica found some shoe prints and patio furniture out of place near their garden wall, leading her to believe that Alicia had exited the home through the back door and then used the furniture to clamber over the wall. Despite leaving with her MacBook and cell phone, there has been no digital trace of Alicia since she disappeared on September 15th, 2019, and her phone has remained powered off. This is one I feel like I might be able to, there has to be a response. They, this might have been solved by now. I'm checking. Alicia. No. Oh, she was just found. <laughs> oh. She was just found literally this year. October 24, 2023. She was found. Jesus. But yeah, she's safe now. Additionally, she looked. It, I heard when I was hearing about a case, I'm like, this looks like one that will be solved. Hundreds of tips and a few tenuous sightings have all gone nowhere. Alicia is still missing. Jessica believes that she met someone online who lured her out of the home. Alicia was not outgoing or quick to trust people, describing herself once as introverted, nerdy, and shy. For these reasons, whoever befriended Alicia likely took their time to gain her trust before making their final move. Although Alicia could have been simply snatched up by a stranger when she left home, she had no reason to run away in the first place. It is more likely that Alicia left under the pretense of meeting an internet friend who ended up being a foe. By the note she left, it's... Technically, no! She met a f dude! was 30-something years old, and she ended up being together for four years, and then she just reappeared. Walked right into a police station. Very weird. It seemed that she intended to return home, so Jessica believes that something or someone is preventing her from coming back, or even contacting any family and friends. Despite her heartache and the gut-wrenching torment of not knowing the whereabouts of her child, Jessica has remained resolute in her search. She also has a message for parents that she shared with News Nation in October of 2021. I do feel that it's very, very necessary for parents to get educated on what their kids are doing on social media, she said. And all these new apps to our- That is a thing that's true. There is parents who need to keep track of what their kids are doing on social media. Most parents just give their kid technology and just say, here, technology, you teach my kid all my shit. I'm just gonna ignore them now. It doesn't work because at least the shit like this happened. People taking advantage of it, but the parents are then made to be seem like they're innocent people. I mean, they all when it comes to the thing, but they should have been looking after the child. To our kids. I myself personally didn't think any dangers since I thought my daughter was safe being at home. I have strangers in my home without them physically being there. For me, my advice to parents is to get educated on what's available out there in social media. Make sure you know your kids' passwords and be constantly talking about the dangers and just monitor their media. Because I definitely believe it's a big, big problem that our youth is facing at the moment. Alicia would now be 17 years old, and she is described as a smaller than average girl with brown hair and brown eyes. At the time of her disappearance, she had braces, stood at 4'9", and weighed 90 pounds. If anyone out there viewing this has any information about Alicia's whereabouts, you can call 623-930-3000 to get in touch with Glendale. I'm not going to say this solved the case, but I kind of wonder if this part really did, this video. Because she's on the internet more than anything else, right? It's not like she knows she's missing unless she was driving by saw a sign. wonder if she like solved this. She's like, oh, oh, people think I'm missing. I might want to go to police with this. I'm gonna go please let them know I'm alive.
Scottsdale, Arizona police. Known as a rising star in Washington, D.C. legal circles and a prominent member of the D.C. Asian American community, 32-year-old lawyer Robert Wohn's murder shook the city. Naturally, being a large metro area, D.C. sees quite a bit of murder, but not in the posh DuPont Circle neighborhood where Robert was killed. Robert lived outside the city in Oakton, Virginia with his wife Kathy and regularly commuted into D.C first for his job with the Covington and Burling law firm, and more recently for his new position as the general counsel for Radio Free Asia. While his new position wasn't as lucrative as his previous job, Robert was enthusiastic about Radio Free Asia's mission to provide uncensored media to disadvantaged communities throughout Asia. However, on the night of August 2, 2006, Robert was working late and decided to stay at his friend's house rather than making the long commute home. Price, the aforementioned friend, had met Robert at William & Mary, where he had attended college, and owned a $1.2 million four-bedroom townhouse in DuPont Circle. Other residents of the property included Price's longtime partner, Victor Zaborski, housemate Dylan Ward, and a young woman who lived... Okay, I'm sorry, listen, I'm not saying he did it, but Dylan Ward looks like a guy who looks like a criminal. Dylan Moore looks like a criminal. I'm not saying it ain't him either. These two are both good options for killers. You look more like it than anyone else. Lived in the basement of the property. When Robert appeared at Price's home around 10.30 p.m., Price and Ward greeted him and chatted in the kitchen, while Zaborski was already upstairs in his bedroom. The basement tenant never came home the night of August 2nd. Shortly after, Robert was shown to the guest room on the second floor. Ward said his goodnights and proceeded to his bedroom, also on the second floor. While Price continued up to the third floor master bedroom he shared with Zaborski. Ward recalled hearing Robert shower and then closed the door to the guest room before he drifted off, thanks to a sleeping pill he had taken earlier. Not long after everyone had gone to bed, Price and Zaborski heard the downstairs door chime, which signaled someone entering. The house was equipped with a security system that would sound whenever a door was opened. Assuming it was their downstairs tenant, the pair thought nothing of it until they heard guttural grunts on the second floor. Jumping out of bed, the two ran downstairs and found Robert bleeding on the bed, with a knife laying on his stomach. At 11.49 p.m., Zaborski called 911 and indicated to the operator that he and his partner were attempting to staunch the bleeding. Okay, is he breathing? He's breathing, but he needs help now. Okay, we have help and roll, ma'am, okay? We do have help and roll. Okay, just go down there and try to tell your husband or your other, um, the other half to just try to keep him calm and talk to him, okay? Oof. Keep him calm and talk to him until someone gets there. Okay. And at the same time, get a dry cloth and just hold it right there in the area. Yes, my partner's holding the... Okay, it, it, holding it on it. okay, and once it gets saturated with blood, tell him get another one. Go get another towel okay. so you can apply it on top of that one once it gets filled up with blood. Okay. We need well, we need you to apply pressure on that area. He is applying pressure right now. Okay, just hold it there until the paramedics get there. They should be pulling up any moment if they're already en route to your location. You don't know who did this. We have no idea who did this. However, by the time the paramedics arrived at the townhouse, Robert's body was suspiciously clean, as was the crime scene. It didn't appear that a gruesome stabbing had occurred at all. In fact, it looked like Robert had been cleaned and dressed. A knife smeared with Robert's blood was found beside the body, and Price remarked to the police that they would likely find his DNA on it since he had moved the weapon, but that the real killer would have worn gloves. Although all three male... Okay. I think this might be a race murder. I think this might be a race murder. I hate crime, I hate murder, whatever you want to call it. There's just two coincidences for it not to be, right? All residents of the townhouse agreed that the killer likely entered through the back door. The story wasn't quite making sense to investigators. There was no sign of forced entry, and Ward's room was before the guest room in the hall. Why would the killer have passed by Ward? That would have meant that Robert was specifically targeted, 
as the only people who knew where he was were the residents of the house and his wife. He and his wife had a loving relationship, and there were no known enemies that would make such a targeted kill plausible. During the autopsy, three stab wounds were found, as well as several needle marks and evidence that indicated Robert had been sexually assaulted and smothered before his death. Police ultimately hypothesized that Robert was drugged with a paralytic agent before being assaulted and murdered. Unfortunately, a routine drug panel yielded no evidence. Nothing was quite adding up, but there were no concrete facts to pin the crimes on Price, Ward, and Zaborski. Eventually, the trio was charged with obstruction of justice in November of 2008. Robert's wife, Kathy, filed a civil lawsuit against them several days later for $20 million. Despite the suspicious circumstances, in 2010, the men were cleared of all charges. The judge said that she believed the men knew more than they were saying, but that she couldn't believe beyond a reasonable doubt that they were guilty of obstruction of justice. Kathy settled her civil suit in 2011 for an undisclosed amount. Sadly, no progress has been made in this bizarre case. A theory pointing to Price's troubled brother Michael has been entertained, but he eventually produced an airtight alibi. Although we may never learn what happened to Robert Wohn, it seems to many that Price, Ward, and Zaborski know something and appear committed to keeping their secret. When asked about her choice to settle by the Washington Post, Kathy Robert noted, I am moving on. I want to spend the next 40 years of my life focusing on good. They can rot from the inside out from all the secrets they chose to keep. That's their choice. I choose to move on. Investigators say the case will remain open, in the hope that they might one day get the additional evidence they need to charge someone. But as of the time of this recording, Robert Eric Wohn's murder remains unsolved. When children go missing, the authorities are usually quick to act, realizing that time is crucial. Unfortunately, the same luxury is rarely afforded to adults who disappear, even when the circumstances are more than a little fishy. In 2017, Elaine Park was a 20-year-old aspiring musician and actress who had landed some bit parts in movies and TV shows like Crazy Stupid Love and Desperate Housewives. Growing up in La Crescenta, a suburb of Los Angeles, she had been a cheerleader in high school, and she was described as spunky and likable. Spunky. Although she had initially pursued higher education at Pierce College in Los Angeles, by January of 2017, she had dropped out, intent on following her acting career. On the night of January 27, 2017, Elaine had gone to a movie with her boyfriend, Divine, or Div Compare, the son of a well-known Los Angeles businessman. The pair had been on again, off again for some time, but had recently reconnected. After the show, security footage showed the pair returning to Div's apartment in Calabasas around 1 a.m., roughly 30 miles west of Elaine's home in La Crescenta. According to Div, the two went to sleep until Elaine woke him around 4 a.m., shaking, singing, and acting oddly. He believed she was in the midst of a panic attack, and he tried to get her to calm down. Two hours later, security footage picked up Elaine walking towards her vehicle around 6 in the morning, appearing stable and normal, despite Div's claims that, still in the throes of her panic attack, she threw on her clothes and left in a hurry without telling him where she was going. At 7.14 a.m., her license plate was recorded leaving the property, but it has been reported that the timestamps on that particular camera were wrong, meaning she left at 6.14 a.m., not 7.14 a.m., this has never been officially confirmed one way or another. Throughout the rest of that day, and on into the following day, January 29th, Elaine remained unreachable by phone, and her mother, Susan, became increasingly worried. She tried to file a report with the local police department, but was rebuffed since Elaine was an adult. Authorities believed at the time that she had simply run off for a bit, despite Susan's protestations that this was extremely out of character for her daughter. They never want to admit that something's off. They always want to rush it off. It's always going to be a thing with missing people. It'll never change my thing. Unless you're a child. Any other time, unless it's a child. If you're even over the age of 10, it'll take them a while before they even just give a damn most of the time. An official report was not filed until Monday, January 30th, after two full days had passed. Yep. 
Police initially questioned Div, but... This is another thing I always find weird. They always say, in a disappearance and in a mystery, the first 48 hours are crucial. When someone disappears, or gets abducted, whatever. But then always have to make, you make them wait the first 48 hours, always the time before you allow to file a missing person report. It makes no sense. I never understand this. Since he remained cooperative and was eventually ruled out as a suspect, his apartment and the surrounding areas were never searched. On February 2nd, Elaine's gray Honda Civic was found just off the Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu. All her doors were unlocked and her personal belongings were still inside the car, including the keys in the ignition. Although the car was dead, the keys were turned to the on position, meaning that the battery had been left to drain. There was no sign of a struggle or foul play, leading investigators to surmise that Elaine had left the car willingly, though it was a strange place for her to have wound up. The car was found 20 miles to the west from her last known location at Div's apartment in Calabasas, and was even further west from her home in La Crescenta. What was she doing on a stretch of highway by the ocean so early in the morning? Clearly, she wasn't on her way home. Dogs were brought in to find her scent, and the search expanded around the surrounding rocky landscape with ATVs, divers, and drones. No trace of Elaine was found. The prevailing theory became suicide, with police believing she simply took her own life. Although Elaine was known to have bouts of depression, her family and friends strongly disagree with this conclusion, suspecting that foul play is the more likely scenario. Police have never ruled out that something sinister may have befallen Elaine, but they continually told her mother it was more likely that she had either committed suicide or run away on her own. Her mother has hired a private investigator to look into the matter, but nothing conclusive has been determined despite multiple cash rewards being offered over the years. Everything about Elaine Park's disappearance is clouded with suspicion, from the muddy timeline of the morning of January 27th to her boyfriend's account and the police's refusal to explore his role further, to the pristine state of her car when it was discovered. Aside from suicide, other theories have been floated over the years. Could she have been abducted by a stranger? It seems unlikely, or at least implausible, that there are no witnesses, since the Pacific Coast Highway is a well-traveled road and it would have been sunny by the time she reached Malibu. Others think the boyfriend, Div, is more involved since there is unaccounted for time, and we don't know for sure if Elaine was behind the wheel of her Honda when it was recorded leaving his apartment. At this juncture, though, everything is pure speculation. Elaine is a Korean-American woman, standing at 5'6", with brown hair and brown eyes. She liked to wear heavy makeup and has three distinctive tattoos, a cow skull and a moth on her left arm, a dagger on her right arm, and a rose on her left shoulder. If you have any information about Elaine Park, you can call the tip line at 1-800-551-3080 or the Glendale Police Department at 818-548-4911. For our final case, we're leaving the United States and heading over to Poland to discuss one of their most baffling unsolved cases, the disappearance of Ivona Wieczorek. Out for a night of fun with her best friend, Idria, and three male acquaintances, 19-year-old Ivona Wieczorek abruptly vanished in the early morning hours of July 17, 2010. Having just graduated from high school, Ivona was currently residing in Gdansk, Poland, and was excitedly planning an upcoming trip to Spain. Though Ivona was still reeling from a fresh breakup with her boyfriend Patrik, her friend Adria managed to get her out of the house for a night on the town with three men the pair had known for about a month. One of them, Pavel, was supposed to be a date for Ivana that night, but the two ultimately decided there wasn't much of an attraction there and continued the night platonically. The night started with casual drinks before progressing to a club in Sopot, about 18 minutes north of Gdansk. Although Ivana started in high spirits, as the night progressed, her mood soured when she learned that her ex, Patrik, was apparently out on the town with other girls. She left the club and began her nearly four-mile journey home on foot around 4 a.m., walking down Seaside Boulevard. On her stroll, she found Adria, and the two had a brief disagreement since Ivona was angry that Adria hadn't left the club when she did. The dispute was diffused over the phone, 
and the pair chatted again a few minutes later when Ivona called Adria to tell her that her phone battery was dying. By now, Adria had left the club and was headed home herself. Ivona disclosed her location on Seaside Boulevard to her friend, and asked if she could come to Adria's house. She didn't want to go home, since she was a little drunk and was hesitant to greet her mother in her current state. Adria, understanding of the situation, left her keys under the mat for Ivona before heading off to bed. As the new day dawned, Adria awoke to find no Ivona in her apartment and her untouched keys still under the mat. She assumed Ivona had headed home instead, while Ivona's family assumed she was with Adria. Her disappearance wouldn't be noticed until late in the afternoon. Once alarms were raised, authorities began to search the area Ivona was last known to be in, but no trace was recovered. The last known image of Ivana was captured on CCTV during her walk home on Seaside Boulevard around 4 o'clock in the morning. She appears tired, holding her heels in her hands, and wearing her clothes from the club. There is a man visible behind her in the footage, wearing a plaid shirt, but he has never been identified by the police, and no witness has ever come forward claiming to be him. Unfortunately, despite the publicity the case received in Poland, not much progress has been made, in 2017, CCTV footage discovered that a maintenance team in the area of Vana was last seen took an unscheduled detour in their truck. The vehicle deviated from its normal route and spent an unknown amount of time in an area with entrances to storm drains. It is hypothesized that Ivona was attacked by one of the men on the team, and they disposed of her body in the storm drains before continuing. Not much more has been heard of the theory, and it seems to be idle speculation for now. In May of 2021, a bag containing a pair of tights and two knives was recovered in the area where Ivana was last seen, but it is not yet clear if those items are in any way related to the case. People also cast their suspicions on the men Ivana was with that night and her ex-boyfriend Patrick. Patrick, especially, seems to keep changing his story about where he was and what he was doing when Ivana vanished, but he has never been formally charged with anything relating to her disappearance. What seems most likely as of now is that Ivona proceeded off Seaside Boulevard into the area where she lived and was either abducted or attacked by someone at that point. Whether her assailant was known to her or not remains to be seen. The man seen behind her in the CCTV footage, though it seems he's the only feasible suspect at the moment, continues to elude police and the public. At the time of her disappearance, Ivona was 5'4 and 140 pounds. She has blonde hair and brown eyes and would now be roughly 30 years old. She may have been taken outside of Poland or even outside of Europe. It's hard to say for sure, but it looks like Ivona's case remains open, though it now appears to be in the hands of a cold case investigation unit. Ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this reaction video. Let me know what you think in the comments. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you all.